The question that we're going to take up this morning is, what is Mystery Babylon? What is Mystery Babylon? Let's start by turning to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, and we'll look in verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Verse 7, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. And so we see in Revelation 17, Mystery Babylon, and there's been a lot of debate over the years, a lot of discussion as to what that refers to. Many of the Protestant reformers thought that Mystery Babylon was a reference to Rome. Many today think that Mystery Babylon is a reference to the literal city of Babylon that will be rebuilt in the future. One of the things that often happens with prophetic subjects is that people view the verses through their current political lens. In other words, if they view a certain region or, or city as an, an enemy or a wrongdoer or you know, currently noteworthy from a political event perspective, they think that is who is going to be uh, the fulfillment of certain prophecies. But what we need to do, I'm just going to put it this way, Scripture tells us the answers. And so we don't need to go to external sources to find the answers. Scripture will tell us. I want to just comment briefly that Mystery Babylon cannot be a rebuilt Babylon, at least as far as I understand. One item that is curious, Saddam Hussein, who of course is now deceased, he wanted to rebuild Babylon. And one of the things that he wanted to do is that uh, he viewed himself and I'm just going to flip here between uh, images, he viewed himself as the second coming or the reincarnation or coming in the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar. And what you can see here are these are coins that he had stamped. And in the background here, of course, is Nebuchadnezzar, and there is Saddam Hussein. So Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was the ruler of a, the vast Babylonian empire, and Saddam Hussein thought of himself in that same regard. The coins are one evidence of that. So what, of course, happened? Well, Saddam Hussein wanted to rebuild Babylon because Babylon was the great city that uh, Nebuchadnezzar reigned from. What happened? It didn't get rebuilt. Now, I'm going to suggest to you from the scriptures that it cannot be rebuilt. So if you would, turn with me to Isaiah 13. Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13. And we will look at verse number 1. So Isaiah 13 and verse number 1. And what we're going to do during the next several moments is we're going to look at several Old Testament passages that, that will tell us how to think about Babylon. So Isaiah 13, verse 1. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. So the burden of Babylon is going to be about the destruction of Babylon. And uh, just as a, as a comment, in these next several passages we're going to look at, I'm not going to read every single verse. You should do that, though. You should make sure that I'm not taking things out of context and that I'm not changing things or something like that. But I'm just going to skip down to verse 17 now. Verse 17, 
Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Verse 1, Isaiah talks about the burden of Babylon, and in verse 17, he tells you how Babylon's going to be destroyed. The Lord is going to stir up the Medes, the Medes and the Persians, and they're going to destroy Babylon. That's what verse 17 is about. Verse 19, and Babylon... The glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldee's excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 20. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Now, with all prophecy, you need to think carefully through the issue of, it, does this prophecy have a, a near-time fulfillment, in other words, near in time to when it was originally written, or does it have a far future fulfillment sometime in the future? So you need to think through those issues in the passages we're going to look at. It seems to me that what these passages are describing is a, a near-term fulfillment. And what we see from verse 20 is, It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Well, if that's true, can mystery Babylon be a rebuilt Babylon if it shall never be inhabited? It wouldn't seem so. Get Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. So what we're evaluating at the moment is, can Mystery Babylon be a reference to Babylon the city, the city that Nebuchadnezzar ruled from? Jeremiah 25 verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, verse 11, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon Seventy years. So the service of the king of Babylon is for 70 years. Verse 12, And it shall come to pass, when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. So notice what verse 12 says. It seems to connect the two things in time, doesn't it? And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. So the Babylonian captivity, in other words, the captivity of Judah in Babylon is for 70 years. And, and then what it says is after that 70 years that God will punish the king of Babylon and he will make it perpetual, in other words, forever, desolations. Verse 13 and I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. So what Jeremiah's prophecy seems to be is that Judah will serve Babylon 70 years, then God will punish Babylon, and it will be perpetual desolations. Get Jeremiah chapter 50. So we're staying in the same book, but we're reading later in the book, Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 1. Jeremiah 50, verse 1. The word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Go down to verse 35. And again, in your free time, read all of the other verses. Jeremiah 50, verse 35, A sword is upon the Chaldeans, saith the Lord, and upon the inhabitants of Babylon, 
and upon her princes and upon her wise men. Verse 39, Therefore the wild beasts of the desert with the wild beasts of the islands shall dwell there, and the owls shall dwell therein, and it shall be no more inhabited forever, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. Notice verse 11. We're in Jeremiah 51, verse 11. Make bright the arrows, gather the shields. The Lord hath raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. Again, Babylon is going to be destroyed by the Medes. For his device is against Babylon to destroy it, because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. Verse 28. Prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes, the captains thereof, and all the rulers thereof, and all the land of his dominion. So Babylon is plainly destroyed by the Medes. Get Daniel if chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. Just a little bit to the right. Daniel chapter 5, verse 28. Thy kingdom is divided. This is a reference to Nebuchadnezzar's descendant, Belshazzar. Daniel 5, 28. Perez Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Daniel 5 is when there's the handwriting on the wall, the finger that appears and writes on the wall. And when Daniel is summoned to interpret it, it's interpreted as thy kingdom, this is a reference to Babylon, is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. What seems clear from all the passages we've looked at is that the Medes and the Persians, uh, particularly the Medes, destroy the Babylonian Empire. So what have we seen so far? And we we were in Isaiah, we've looked at various passages in Jeremiah, we've also seen in Daniel. It's clear that the destruction of Jerusalem is by the Medes. We've also seen that it was performed within 70 years of the time of the prophecies, within 70 years of the beginning of the Babylonian captivity of Judah. And once that judgment is performed, it seems what the scriptures say is that Babylon shall never be inhabited, it shall be no more inhabited forever, and it will be a perpetual, endless desolation. Now, maybe those things have a future fulfillment, but it seems to me in looking at them that that perpetual desolation, the beginning of that uh, period where they're never inhabited, corresponds to the destruction by the Medes. So if that's the case, then Babylon cannot be the mystery Babylon of Revelation 17 because Babylon is not going to be rebuilt, according to the Scriptures. So that poses a problem. If Babylon is not going to be rebuilt, and therefore Babylon cannot be mystery Babylon, then what is? And uh, I'm just going to give you the spoiler here, ready, and then we're going to try to prove it to you. It seems that mystery Babylon is the city of Jerusalem. So let's think about that. So go back with me to Revelation 17, verse 5. Revelation 17, verse 5. Now, mystery Babylon is is a common term that that people use. And it's I believe when it's most of the time when it's heard, it's perceived as, if you will, one phrase, mystery Babylon the two words going together. 
But notice carefully what Revelation 17, 5 says, mystery, comma, Babylon. So there's, there's a pause there. Um, it's not necessarily saying that it is a reference to the city of Babylon itself. It's mystery, comma, Babylon. Now, one thing that's fascinating, if you think of the section of the scriptures, Hebrews to Revelation, the city of Jerusalem is never mentioned in those scriptures. Hebrews all the way through Revelation, the word Jerusalem never appears in reference to the current Jerusalem. In other words, you will find the word Jerusalem when it's the new Jerusalem. In other words, the city that is on the new heavens and the earth out in eternity future. But you never see Jerusalem used in reference to the Jerusalem, the physical city that is on the earth today. When Jerusalem is referenced, get Revelation 11, verse 8, when Jerusalem is referenced, it is referenced in a way where it's called by another name. So I'll show you an example of that. Look with me, Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. This is when the two witnesses are killed. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Well, what city is that? Where was the Lord crucified? He was crucified in Jerusalem. So Revelation 11 verse 8 is obviously talking about Jerusalem, but it doesn't use the word, does it? What it does is it describes it as the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. So Revelation 11 verse 8 doesn't refer to Jerusalem by its proper or given name or its normal name. It refers to it using a spiritual description. Spiritually, it's described as Sodom or Egypt. Get with me Revelation 17.5. Now, in, verse, in, in Revelation 11, verse 8, it, was, it said, in the street of the great city. So the city that's being referenced there is described as great, and that's obviously a reference to Jerusalem because the Lord was crucified there. What's curious about Revelation 17, 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, what does it say? The great. So you see that great terminology in both places. Now you're in Revelation 17, go down to verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So this mystery, Babylon the Great, this city, we are told in verse 9 that it sits on seven mountains. Now the Protestant reformers looked at that verse and they thought, well, that's a reference to Rome because Rome sits on seven hills. That's, that, that is a, a true statement geographically as far as I'm aware. Guess what else sits on seven mountains? The city of Jerusalem does. Now get with me 1 Peter 5 verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. This verse is a, a, a fascinating verse, frankly an incredibly confusing verse. Look with me at what it says. 1 Peter 5, verse 13. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. So we're in 1 Peter. Who is 1 Peter written by? Not a tricky question. I mean, just in case there's any doubt. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered. So 1 Peter is written by Peter. That's no surprise. 
But what is remarkable in verse 13, the church that is at Babylon elected together with you? So let's look at a map here just for a minute. Let's go here, actually. Here we go. So on our map here, we can see right here is Jerusalem. And then we can see that right over here is Babylon. And you can see here is the legend of the map. And this distance right here is 300 miles. So there to there is some distance much greater than 300 miles. I didn't look up the exact figure, but it's quite far. So think about this with me just for a minute. Was Peter writing from Babylon when he says the church that is elected together at Babylon saluteth you? I mean, think about that with me just for a minute. At the time when that would have been written, first century AD, Babylon was desolate and uninhabited. Peter, of course, as we know, was the leader of the kingdom church. Peter was not part of the body of Christ. You may recall in the book of Acts when Stephen was stoned and there was a persecution that arose about Stephen, what happened to the kingdom saints at Jerusalem? They were scattered. But where did Peter and the twelve go? They remained in Jerusalem. So there's no indication, there's no reason to believe that Peter would have traveled to Babylon. There's no reason to think there was any church there because it was uninhabited. If there was a church there, it would in all likelihood be a church that was part of the body of Christ, not the kingdom church. We're never told anything about the kingdom saints that are scattered. They go up this way. They, nothing indicates that they are scattered into Babylon, a city that was uninhabited. Look with me at Acts 15, Acts chapter 15, and we'll look at verse 7, Acts 15, verse 7, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, this is occurring in Jerusalem. Um, so in Acts 15, Peter remains in Jerusalem. So what all of that does, I'm going to suggest to you, is when you look at 1 Peter 5, verse 13, and he says the church elected together at Babylon, you can say, well, he's literally in Babylon, but it seems so contrary to the other verses. Or what you could do is, we know from Acts 15, that after the persecution that arose, Peter remained in Jerusalem, and you can take the Babylon to be a reference to Jerusalem. Just as in Revelation 11, when it described Jerusalem, it says, which spiritually is called, capital S, Sodom and Egypt. It seems like Babylon would be another name for Jerusalem. Get with me Revelation chapter 18. The scriptures all fit together. Everything within the scriptures, every verse is accurate. So when we see things that seem to say different things, it tells us there's a flaw in our understanding. It's not that we pick one verse and we say, well, the other verse is wrong because I like this verse better. All the verses are true. And our job as students is to understand how they fit together because there is a way that they do fit together. Look with me at Revelation 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. So here's Babylon again. Is fallen and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So in Revelation 18, obviously it's talking about Babylon. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, 
my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So verse 4 is a command for God's people to come out of her, to come out of Babylon, which means that they had to previously be in her, obviously, right? They had to previously be, be within Babylon. Well, think with me just for a moment. As you think about what happens during Daniel's 70th week, where would Israel be located? So as you think about the 70th week, does Israel, do, do believing saints, do they go to Babylon or do they return to Israel? Well, they return to Israel. See, what verse 4 says, when, it, when, it, when God commands his people to come out of her, it means they had to be located there and they weren't located in Babylon. They would have been located in, in Judah, in Jerusalem. You're in Revelation 18. Look at verse 20. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Now consider that verse. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets. So the apostles rejoice, for God hath avenged you on her. So the apostles were mistreated by Babylon. Well, were they mistreated by the city of Babylon? See, the twelve apostles lived during the Lord's earthly ministry. So just think through this for a minute. The twelve apostles live right here, during the Lord's earthly ministry, right before the cross. Were they mistreated by Babylon? They weren't because Babylon had been destroyed hundreds of years before they were born. They weren't mistreated by the physical city of Babylon. Who were they mistreated by? Well, they were persecuted by unbelieving Israel. And then look with me at verse 24. Revelation chapter 18, verse 24. And in her, this is Babylon, was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. So in her, in Babylon, whoever this is, was found the blood of prophets. Now think with me for a minute. Is there another verse, a cross-reference, that tells you that Babylon must be a reference to Jerusalem? The most powerful Thing to do in the study of scriptures is to find cross-references because the scriptures are interwoven, they're interlocked, and they cannot be broken. What verse 24 just told us is that in her, and that's Babylon based upon Revelation 18 verse 2, in her was found the blood of the prophets. Well, if there's a verse that tells us anything about the blood of the prophets and where it's located, that would be a very powerful cross-reference. Get Luke 13. Luke 13. Luke 13 and verse 33. Luke 13, verse 33. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following. Notice, for it cannot be that a prophet perish outside of Jerusalem. Where do prophets have to perish according to the Lord? They have to perish within Jerusalem because they cannot perish outside of Jerusalem. Verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her, her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Let's make sure we're completely clear on what Luke 13, 33, and 34 are telling us. 
The Lord says in verse 33, it cannot be that a prophet perish outside of Jerusalem. Well, if, if it cannot be that a prophet perish outside of Jerusalem, where do all the prophets have to perish? Inside Jerusalem. It's the only other option. Verse 34, in case that wasn't clear, who is it that killeth the prophets? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets. So Luke 13 unmistakably says that Jerusalem kills the prophets and that's where the prophets perish. What were we just reading in Revelation 18 verse 24? Revelation 18 verse 24, referring to Babylon, and in her, Babylon, was found the blood of prophets. So Revelation 18 which references Babylon, must and can only be a reference to Jerusalem. That verse, I, I really see no way to get around those two cross-references. See, what those tell you unmistakably is that when Revelation is talking about Babylon, and by the way, it says mystery Babylon. In other words, it's not simply Babylon, but there is some mysterious aspect to it. Now, you may recall from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, that a mystery is described as hidden wisdom. A mystery is not just wisdom. There's an aspect to it that is hidden. Well, when Revelation 17 refers to mystery Babylon, it's not referring to the literal city Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar lived in. It's referring to Babylon, but there's a mystery aspect to it. There's a hidden aspect to it. It's hidden, but it's not hidden in a way that we can't understand it. When we compare Scripture with Scripture, we noticed that Jerusalem doesn't occur in Hebrews through Revelation except with regard to the New Jerusalem. We noticed in Revelation 11 that Jerusalem is sometimes referred to spiritually by other names like Sodom and Egypt, that describe what Jerusalem is like. Well, what did we just learn? Jerusalem can also be described as mystery, comma, Babylon the Great. So hopefully you see how that all fits together. So mystery Babylon, despite whatever people say about it based upon political events or current events, according to the scriptures, mystery Babylon the Great is very clearly Jerusalem. So let's notice now, go to Revelation 18 if you're not already there. Let's go to Revelation 18 and let's notice a couple things about mystery, Babylon the Great. The first thing I want you to notice in verse 10, we'll look at a couple verses about this, is that mystery Babylon is going to have tremendous wealth. Revelation 18, verse 10. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. So the merchants of the earth all do business with Mystery Babylon. Verse 12, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, all of these luxuries, all of these extravagances, and all fine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, notice, and slaves, and souls of men. So does Mystery Babylon have tremendous wealth? Yes. Is there wickedness in that wealth? Yes, there is. It includes things like slaves and souls of men. 
verse 14. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. So Mystery Babylon has tremendous, tremendous, tremendous wealth, but what happens to it? It's, it ceases. It ends. It is brought down suddenly. Get with me Matthew 24, verse 15. Matthew 24, verse 15. Matthew 24, 15. Matthew 24 talks about Daniel's 70th week. It's a description of events that occur during the last days. We're going to look specifically at the abomination of desolation. So Matthew 24, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand. During the midst of the 70th week, that's when the abomination of desolation is set up. It's set up in that it is set up in the holy place. The man of sin sets up the abomination of desolation in the temple. It's inside Jerusalem. Notice verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. God does not command believers in Israel to flee into the mountains at the beginning of the 70th week. He commands them to flee in the midst of the 70th week when the abomination of desolation is set up. Now think with me just for a moment. When we were in Revelation 18, What did God say to his people? Come out of her. So they had to be located within her. Well, isn't that what Matthew 24, 16 says? Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. See what Revelation 18 has to be referencing when it says come out of her. It has to be referring to where those believers were currently located. And where are they located? They're located within Judea. They're located in Jerusalem. So let's put a couple things together then. Mystery Babylon, i.e. Jerusalem at that time, will be incredibly enticing. It will be incredibly attractive to the Jewish people. Why is that? Well, one reason is it will have peace. If you think about, for example, Israel today, does Jerusalem, does Judea have peace? Well, it doesn't have peace, right? Because there's terrorist activities that are conducted against Jerusalem, against Judea. It doesn't have peace today. But what will happen during the 70th week is that the man of sin acquires enough political power over the nations around Jerusalem that he will sign a covenant with Israel to guarantee their peace and safety. Now, he signs that covenant. Ultimately, he's going to act contrary to it, but he signs that covenant with Israel guaranteeing them peace. And, of course, you can imagine that Israel would be happy to sign that after they've had years and years of war and opposition and terrorist activity. So Jerusalem has peace because of the covenant that is signed with the man of sin. What it also has is it has incredible wealth. We saw that in Revelation chapter 18. So not only is it a city that has peace, it has incredible wealth. Of course, it's the homeland of the Jew. Now, when you think of what happened 
with the Babylonian captivity, what happened to Judah? Well, and let's even rewind a bit. When Israel is split into the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and they operate independently, there are the ten tribes of the northern kingdom and the two tribes of the southern kingdom. Well, the northern kingdom is conquered by Assyria. And then, hundreds of years later, the southern kingdom is conquered by Babylon. As a result of those two conquests, where do the Jewish people end up? Well, they end up scattered throughout the nations of the world. If you think about, for example, the book of Esther, which occurs subsequent to the destruction of Babylon, because it's written during the Media Persian Empire. If you think about what happens at that point, that empire stretches from India to Ethiopia, and the Jewish people are scattered abroad within that massive, massive area. That's why Haman's letter goes out to all of the provinces of that empire, the 127 provinces of it, because it's an attempt to destroy the Jews in all of that area. In other words, what I'm simply making the point is this. When Israel and Judah are conquered, the end result, what's often known as the diaspora, the Jewish people are dispersed throughout the nations of the world. Well, think about what happens during the 70th week. Many of those Jews that have been dispersed, they would be happy to return to their homeland they may not enjoy, I mean, presumably they wouldn't, the persecution that they may face in the other areas in which they live. So what do they do? Well, when the man of sin signs the covenant with Israel guaranteeing peace, they return to the homeland. And when there's tremendous wealth within Jerusalem, doesn't that make it even more attractive? So you see what happens during the 70th week is there's some very powerful reasons for the dispersed Jewish people to return to their homeland. But there's another thing that we need to consider. Look with me at, get with me Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. That's a reference to the, the economic growth that is just extraordinary during that time. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. This is the man of sin. And by peace, well, he signs that covenant of Israel guaranteeing them peace, but notice what it says. And by peace shall destroy many. He signs the covenant guaranteeing peace, but what's going to be the ultimate result of it? Destruction and the destruction of many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. How's that going to go? But he shall be broken without hand. That, that's his destruction. Get with me Luke 21. Luke chapter 21, Luke 21, verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed, that's encircled, surrounded, compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. Now you probably noticed this. When we were in Matthew 24 just a bit ago, it had a verse very similar to 21. In other words, Matthew 24, 16, talked about them, then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. But the verse immediately before is slightly different. So Matthew 24, 15 talks about the abomination of desolation. And that is the clue to, to flee Jerusalem. Luke 21, verse 20 doesn't talk about the abomination of desolation, but it says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem, 
compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. See, what happens is this. The man of sin comes to power. He acquires political influence, and he has enough authority and credibility that Israel will sign the, the, the peace covenant, the, the protection treaty with him. But we know that from Daniel 8, by peace he shall destroy many. So what happens, if you will, is what the, the man of sin subsequently does is he surrounds Jerusalem with armies. Why does he surround Jerusalem with armies at the same time as the abomination of desolation? Well, when the abomination of desolation is set up, that's the clue. That's the, 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 the indicator. Now is the time to flee. Well, the man of sin, Satan himself, is familiar with Matthew 24. He understands what it says. So what does he do? Let me put these armies around Jerusalem so when you want to flee and get out of it, it's not going to be simple to do that. The armies are there to prevent that from happening. Think about what a successful trap must be. A successful trap must be very enticing. So if you think of going out in the woods and setting up an animal trap, if you set up an animal trap but there's no food in the trap, is the trap going to work very well? Well, the animal's not going to mess with it. There has to be something to attract the prey to the trap. There has to be some sort of bait right? Well, there has to be bait. In this case, it seems what the bait is, is that Israel has promised peace, and, it, and Jerusalem is going to be a city of tremendous wealth. So who wouldn't want to go there? This is the opportunity for Israel to return to its homeland at a time of peace and prosperity. Sounds tremendous. Let's do it. And that's what the vast majority of Israel does. So the, the trap has very enticing bait. But what does it also have to do? It has to also have very effective concealment. What happens if you set up a trap for the animal and it's obvious how the trap works and the animal can look at that and says, well, that bait looks attractive, but I can see the danger. So the, it has to be concealed as to, what, as to how the trap will work. So what, what does the man of sin do? Well, he comes in with the appearance of peace, but he is very, very deceptive, and people do not perceive it. And then finally, what else does a trap have to have? Well, it has to operate with ruthless efficiency once the trap is sprung. And so what happens during the first part of Daniel's 70th week, the man of sin is perceived as a good guy. He's a charismatic figure, and the world wonders after him, and he is viewed as, a, as someone that is a force for good. But what's going to happen is, on a dime, he'll go into the temple, he'll set up the abomination of desolation, he'll have the armies encompass and circle Jerusalem, so that when Israel tries to flee, it's not going to be easy. The reason why the verses say if you're on that housetop, don't go down inside to get your coat is because you better get out of there immediately because it will not be simple. And so what he'll do is the armies will encompass Jerusalem. The mark will be instituted. If you don't have the mark, you can't buy or sell. And so people will be presented with the very, very, horrible and difficult choice. You either take the mark, in which case you can buy and sell and physically exist, but in so doing, what happens when someone takes the mark? They've committed an unforgivable sin that damns their soul for eternity. Make no mistake, the mark of the beast is unforgivable. There is nothing that can be done to undo it. Once someone takes the mark of the beast, that is it for their soul eternally. Now, praise the Lord, we live during the dispensation of grace. We're not going to be here for the mark of the beast because 
the rapture is pre-tribulational. We will depart the earth prior to that. And that is a reason why we need to be preaching the gospel, because we need to tell as many people as possible how to be saved, that they can be saved and not be here for the 70th week. So option one is you take the mark of the beast. And if you do, you're physically you're physically okay in that you can buy and sell, but your soul will be damned. If you refuse the mark of the beast, what's going to happen? Well, then you're going to be martyred if you're in Jerusalem at that time. See, what is, it's going to, what's going to happen is those within Jerusalem, with its apparent freedom and with its tremendous material prosperity, are not going to want to leave it. They're going to hesitate to do that. Wait, I'm going to run into the wilderness with just the clothes on my back and leave all this here? Why would I do that? See, it's going to require an act of faith for someone to voluntarily leave Jerusalem at that time. And it will be those in Israel that believe God's word that will do that. So let's pull this all together. What is mystery Babylon? The historical view is that it's Rome. A more modern view is that it's the literal city of Babylon rebuilt. But it seems that neither of those are the correct answer. It's rather obvious that when you get into the scriptures and study it, mystery, Babylon the Great, is a reference to Jerusalem during the 70th week. The lesson here for us is this. We, we shouldn't read the Bible through the lens of the newspaper. We shouldn't read it through the lens of current political events. Because what that does then is we use whatever is happening now and we tweak the language of the Bible so that it supports what is current events. But what happens is when you let the Bible speak and when you compare verse with verse, when you compare cross-reference with cross-reference, Scripture itself teaches you that mystery, Babylon the Great, is Jerusalem. Thank you for tuning in. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word gives us clarity as to what we need to know. We thank you that you have preserved the scriptures for us. We thank you especially for the gospel of grace. We thank you that we cannot lose our salvation today. We thank you that it is a free gift purchased by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that we would just be faithful to continue to preach the word, that we would be instant in season, out of season, that the world may know how to be saved. We give you all the glory, and we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.